Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. How many of you guys, okay, understand when I'm talking about, you know, difficulty breathing? I mean, there are many reasons that can cause a patient to have difficulty breathing, you know, and the two most common ones that we see as pulmonologists or, uh, you know, lung physicians are COPD and asthma. There's other things like congestive heart failure, pneumonia, you know, bronchitis um, uh, that can do that as well. But... Uh, I want to just see a show of hands and make this kind of interactive. How many people here have COPD or been told that they have COPD by their physicians? Okay. All right. We will spend some time discussing that. And how many here in the audience have asthma? Okay. And that, yeah, and they could be a crossover. And usually COPD is more prevalent than asthma, probably four to one, five to one, uh, because of the, uh, the, the disease entity and the patient population. So about, well, I would say close to 20 million plus in uh, the U.S. suffer from um, COPD, whether it be emphysema, bronchitis, or uh, obstructive airways disease. And about maybe a quarter of that have asthma. So maybe about four to five million. So it's uh, a higher than, uh, let's say, even diabetes and uh, breast cancer put together. Uh, uh, in COPD. Okay, so this is just a very brief kind of a medical definition, if you will, of COPD. Okay, it is preventable and treatable. So one needs to know, if you have it, that it's not irreversible and, you know, many things that can be tried and, uh, you know, uh, patients may wonder, you know, sometimes my doctor says, you know, it's very difficult to treat COPD. It is, but we have more available to us now. And uh, there are things that COPD affect, not only the lungs, but it does affect extra pulmonary uh, systems as well. I mean, people that have COPD can have heart conditions, they can have you know, uh, malnutrition, they, could be, uh, they can have infections. And uh, because it is a uh, fairly significant problem, it uh, predisposes one to other health problems. And uh, the primary component, of course, is in your lungs. So if you have COPD, most of the symptoms are related to the, the airways or the lungs itself, and, and uh, airflow limitation causing difficulty breathing. It's not fully reversible, but that doesn't mean it's not reversible to an extent and treatable to an extent. And the airflow limitations, which I will go into more in more detail, is constriction as well as inflammation of the airways caused by something out either environmentally, you know, uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, air when it's a poor air quality with pollution or from uh, inhaled particulates, whether it be from smoking or occupational exposure um, or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, infections. And that will cause a set of reactions in your lung. So this is kind of uh, the two main pathways that uh, affect airflow limitation. Once an infection or a uh, insult occurs in the lungs, there's an inflammation that occurs. Inflammation is like redness, if you will, or swelling. Just like if you have a strep throat, you have inflammation in your throat or your glands, and it becomes red and it becomes irritated. That's the same thing that happens in, in your lungs. And when it happens in your lungs, it can cause constriction, narrowing, difficulty breathing, both in, inhaling or exhaling. And then when it becomes more advanced and severe, it, it destroys uh, the structure of your lungs, the alveoli and the lung uh, itself. And these are the kind of the steps that happens. You inhale something that's noxious, whether it could be smoke, whether it could be fumes, chemicals, uh, dust, the inflammation occurs, 
your body tries to defend against it, then you have uh, enzymes that break it down, stress that occurs, and then the COPD, um, uh, so to speak, happens, and the diagnosis can be made, either from a chest x-ray or breathing test or the combination of the two, and of course, symptoms. So when a patient presents to either their primary care physician, their, uh, pr uh, meaning their internist or their family practitioner, or are referred to a specialist like myself, the symptoms that they usually almost always complain of 75 to 90 percent of the time are cough, which is more than just like a short term, but a prolonged persistent cough. Sputum production, usually it's thicker, it's usually more discolored, either yellow or green, and if it's green, then you start thinking of an infection and dyspnea, which is another term for shortness of breath, more than their usual baseline. And then if they have those constellation of symptoms, plus the, uh, the risk factors from the exposures, if a, a physician takes the history and usually they ask three important questions. Have they smoked or had secondhand smoke? Have they been in an occupation that they're, uh, you know, really enclosed in an environment that there's poor ventilation and there's a lot of dust or chemicals uh, flying around and um, both indoor and outdoor. And those things clue us in to saying, okay, you need to be checked with a workup. The workup would consist of, most importantly, a spirometry test, which is the pulmonary function test that Margaret does or a lot of offices do. And it can uh, determine how restricted and uh, obstructed and how decreased your lung function capacity is. And it's a simple test. It's almost like, to me, the equivalence of having your blood pressure checked or the equivalence of having your cholesterol checked or your hemoglobin A1C. They're really important uh, benchmarks to where you are from a diagnosis standpoint or where you are as far as your progression or regression. So this is a, a, a graphic. Even though it looks confusing and scientific, it really isn't. So when you do a spirometry test, okay, the technician or the nurse will tell you to blow, blow, blow. So if you blow, 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 the first second is recorded right away. If you have COPD, I don't have a pointer, but it's the top curve, it will drop uh, a little bit. You can only probably get about two to three liters out. And that's not adequate. That's usually trapped. So some of it is still in your lungs. Whereas a normal, healthy person with normal lungs without asthma or COPD can blow out about four to five liters of air in that same time frame, one second. Then after you've exhaled to your full capacity and you can't get anything out anymore after five or six seconds, a normal person can blow out close to six liters over five, and a person with COPD will still have lungs, uh, still have air trapped in their lungs, so they can probably get about three and a half, four liters. So they are limited in their first second, and they're limited throughout their entire exhalation, so what they call air trapping. So they can't get it out. So it's almost like, in, 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 in some ways, like constipation of the airways. You feel full bloated. You feel like you just can't get it all out. And that's very restricting and, uh, and limiting. So the more you exercise, the more you have to hyperventilate to get the air in and the oxygen to uh, give uh, oxygen to your muscles, the more you trap. The more you trap, the more of a disadvantage you are at, at breathing. And this is the gold or number one uh, guideline for criteria for COPD severity. So if you just looked at that previous graph, if your FVV1 FVC ratio is under 70%, so we could go back here, that COPD person is 60%, so they've already been diagnosed because they're under 70, and the normal's 80, so it's not COPD, they have COPD. Then the severity of their COPD is based on how much air they can get out in the first second. If they can get out at least 80%, they're mild. If they can only get out 50 to 80%, when you put the ratio together, then they're considered moderate. If you have only a capacity of getting uh, 30 to 50% out, you're considered severe. And if it's less than 30%, or if you're less than 50, but with other chronic respiratory failure ailments, then you're very severe. And I'll tell you what those implications mean. I know that we're still trying to educate our patients to be better knowledgeable and um, understanding of these numbers like they do understand what cholesterol, HDL, LDL, um, blood pressure means, because a lot of my uh, patients still are not that keen on knowing what these numbers are. But as time has passed and, and we've had opportunities to have these seminars and doctors have come to some of my you know, uh, uh, programs, then they will stress and emphasize that these are things that you could monitor on your own or 
on your visits and your appointments. And also, you can do what they call a peak flow meter. And I'll show you what that is, that you can actually check or gauge if you're in the green zone, the yellow zone, or the red zone to see where you are at any given point in time. There used to be a stage zero, but a stage zero is not really in the uh, guidelines anymore. A stage zero is you may have symptoms of a prolonged cough that doesn't go away with antibiotics, or the shortness of breath is more severe than baseline. That should trigger anyone, physicians of course, nurse practitioners, and even family members to say, someone in this family, you know, the person that's complaining of this is not their normal state. And it's not just a, let's say, a virus or a, a flu that uh, they should have their doctor check it out. And the first thing that should be done is the spirometry test. And these four areas is kind of like where we start our guideline treating wise to the patient. So if they're mild, the blue, all the way to the yellow and then the deep yellow, I'll teach you guys how we would instruct our patients and activate therapy. So if they are at the mild or at risk stage, I would say get the flu vaccine. Now even, you know, they're thinking of giving H1N1 to people that are at risk. So far, we are giving it to children and healthcare workers, uh, but uh, there's uh, may become a time that uh, I, I talked to a doctor in Oakland yesterday and he's been giving it to his staff as well as uh, some of the, uh, the younger population uh, with the nasal spray. Um, and then there's the um, short-acting albuterol. So when you're in the mild stage, you may get symptoms intermittently, like an occasional attack or an occasional exacerbation where either you overdid it and you feel tight in the chest, then you could use like a couple of puffs of albuterol. When you're in the moderate stage and you're more advanced, based on the diagnosis and the testing, then you should be on more regular standing treatment every 12 hours, every eight hours, every six hours of a longer acting bronchodilator, like perhaps um, uh, you could use uh, something like Advair, which has uh, Cerevent or Salmeterol in it with an inhaled steroid. So you can uh, open up the bronchial tubes as well as decrease the inflammation. And then when you become more on the severe end, uh, then you should, uh, at times even be using possibly steroids like prednisone for 5, 10, 15 days. Uh, and then if you get to the very severe stage, then you may need to use oxygen because it will, of course, aid in your breathing and uh, make you less symptomatic. But it also has been shown study-wise, both in Great Britain and in the United States, that oxygen also helps open the, uh, the pulmonary arteries so that uh, you don't get stiffening of the right ventricle part of your heart so it could be a heart-lung phenomenon. And the difference in which I will talk about more as I uh, segue from COPD to asthma is the, the clinician should be able to tell based on these at least early sets of criteria the difference between the two because they do have different treatment plans and ramifications. So the difference between COPD and asthma is that COPD occurs later in life. Asthma is usually early onset even though adult onset can happen but the majority, let's just say. Symptoms are more slow and progressive with COPD. So one might complain to the doctor after six months of persistent symptoms, and then by the last two or three weeks, it's just become more laborious for the breathing. Whereas asthma is a variation from day to day, you know, and from s scenario to scenario, different events may trigger it, and then they can be perfectly fine. That will not be the case in COPD. Uh, there's usually a smoking history related to it, Whereas in asthma, usually there is not. The symptoms are a uh, li little bit worse in the nighttime and early mornings for, asthmat for asthmatics. And uh, for COPD, it's during exercise and activity. But there is a phenomenon called exercise-induced asthma that can worsen asthma during exercise. Allergies and eczema and other types of immune reactions are closely tied in with asthma. There's more of a family history component in asthma, and it's largely reversible from the airflow limitation standpoint. Whereas in COPD, there's less reversibility, though there's not total irreversibility unless they reach end-stage emphysema. There are multiple risk factors for COPD, not just smoking, although that is the highest risk factor, probably 90%, 95%, but exposure to different particulates, genetic, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a, is a gene deficiency. Um, occupational exposure, as I mentioned, both indoor, outdoor, 
uh, pollutions, uh, the, the way your lungs develop and grow. Sometimes women get COPD worse than men because their lungs are smaller. And when there's more disease process, they have less, let's say, uh, uh, ability to compensate. Uh, different oxidative stresses, um, I already alluded to the gender differences, age, of course, respiratory infections, socioeconomic status more, uh, I think, is linked to uh, access to health care and early uh, treatment and diagnosis, and uh, nutritional factors and other comorbidities, like how much is heart disease related to this or has a play, or um, diabetes or hypertension or kidney failure. Um, since smoking is about the highest uh, uh, risk factor, uh, we uh, certainly have um, attempted at, at, at the best we can to advise patients to quit smoking. I mean, that's the first and foremost thing because if anything's going to improve lung function is smoking cessation. And you ask them systemically, identify uh, all those that are smoking at every visit. And sometimes people will be extremely truthful and will, you know, give it to you straight. And then some will just say, you know, well, I quit, but well, wait a minute, I had one this Saturday or, you know, whatever the case, they haven't really quit. So you try to um, identify those, and then you advise them to quit. And the way you can keep them you know, in that, because I will give a seminar uh, about a month from now or two weeks from now on smoking cessation, is to determine their willingness to, to quit. And then once you have that determination, uh, is to assist their quitting and then schedule follow-up contacts, because it's easy to fall back. And this is just a very general schematic about the tracheal bronchial tree and the uh, anatomy of the respiratory system uh, because that will lead to, you know, uh, where the disease processes occur. You know, so from the trachea down to the bronchi to the bronchioles to the alveoli, you know, you can get inflammation, edema, um, mucus plugs, mucus secretions all throughout. And then when you get to the alveoli, which is the grape-like sacs in the bottom um, right corner, is where the gas exchange occurs. So if there's destruction there, uh, people will start having low oxygen levels and high carbon dioxide levels. And that's where extreme symptoms uh, and disability and uh, impairment occur. And then if you break it down into the tiny little bronchioles, there's these hair follicles called cilia and these uh, mucus secreting cells, the green, that will produce thick mucus uh, to maybe try to uh, defend against bacteria or viral infections. But because of the suppressed mechanism of the hair follicles, the cilia, to beat and escalate that mucus to flow, there becomes that th thick, uh, viscous uh, secretions that are problematic because patients can't expectorate that out. And that's become one of the, the, the major problems uh, leading to pneumonias and leading to, uh, you know, very uh, uh, difficulty uh, uh, with the, uh, the breathing process. and. Uh, usually prompts patients to come in to be seen um, emergently uh, to the uh, emergency room. Um, and uh, more often than not, they're, they're going to probably need to be admitted for antibiotics and to have, you know, um, better medications to, uh, to improve that lung uh, ability to clear those secretions. And this is the time of year that this will start to occur more, more frequently. More exacerbations and hospitalizations occur from the months of November to about January, February, just due to the the weather changes, the, uh, the, uh, the population mix, the being indoors, being more exposed to people, contacts are, are, are much more um, readily available to transmit the disease processes. So, you know, so to be on the alert is recognition and understand what's going on from these just basic few slides that I gave and then to uh, inform your physicians to any changes in your clinical condition and then uh, and then to monitor yourself and also be monitored when you're um, um, seen in your appointments. Now to switch gears a little bit, asthma is a little bit different, but there's still the same process of difficulty breathing in your, in your airways. Now for those that raise their hands that have asthma, even though it was fewer, um, this is sometimes a test that we can give. You know, usually they have to be 12 and older, and if they answer these, um, you can usually pretty much say, even without the pulmonary function test, that they have asthma. And you could check this website as a resource on um, asthmaactionamerica.org uh, to give a lot more information. So the five or six questions that are usually asked either by the uh, respiratory therapists or the nurse practitioners, sometimes the physicians, if uh, this is a new patient. Uh, over the last several weeks, how much time did your asthma keep you from getting as much work done 
at home, like either housework or you know, work around the yard. Uh, if it's in the green, they're fine. If they're in the red, then there's something that's not normal. And then uh, it de depends on the quantity, the frequency. Then in the next uh, question, over that period of time, how often have you experienced shortness of breath? And then again, it's based on frequency. And then uh, another common question is, during th those four weeks, how often did your asthma symptoms uh, keep you awake or kept you from sleeping well? Like you were coughing or wheezing or needed to use your inhalers during the night. Uh, if it's often, then there's something that needs to be adjusted, either uh, treatment-wise or um, they have to be worked up a little bit more thoroughly. And then last, uh, no, second to last question is, during the past four weeks, how often have you used your inhalers? Have you used it more frequently as your rescue? That's not good because that's not the only thing to treat asthma. Using a rescue inhaler is indeed important, but it's only for rescue. For maintenance, there's other things you can use, which I'll talk to you a little bit later. And then how would you rate your asthma? This is very tricky. I, I've done this survey myself on my own patients, and I've also read the kind of the national survey. And more often than not, patients with pretty educated and knowledgeable about their condition and has had it for years feel that they're better controlled than their actual tests show. Let's say I ask Joe Smith, oh, how, how, how do you think your asthma is controlled? They may say, oh, it's well controlled or it's completely controlled. And then I do a peak flow right there in the office or a spirometry and I see they're 50% or 60%. And I go, you know, you know why? It's because you adapt. You tolerate what you've become accustomed to. So you decrease your exercise. You decrease activities which worsen that. So your body adapts to things you are not comfortable with. So they just say, okay, I'm doing okay. But the thing is, they're limiting what they normally could and should be doing. So if you've checked red in any of the uh, boxes, then you know that the uh, healthcare professional needs to adjust your treatment plan. So I was talking about inflammation. Well, here's how it looks under a bronchoscopy exam. So you look in a normal bronchus and it's very pink, open and clear, whereas if you have an inflamed bronchial tube, it is swollen, it's red, it's narrow, and you're breathing through a straw as opposed to a pipe. And that's the key component, is the airway diameter. And pulmonary function tests are one modality to check that, and uh, we do that in the office or here at the hospital, and uh, these are uh, some tests that we showed from an earlier graph. And what I wanted to uh, um, highlight here is that the FEV1s improve significantly, 13, 15, 20 percent, uh, by the treatment that you use, whether it be albuterol or Zopinex or whatever. And that means there's some reversibility. So as you can see, the red versus the blue is a significant 13 percent improvement. Anything above 10 to 12 percent is significant. And I've seen 25 percent. And now we've got better drugs that can even get up to 25 to 30 percent. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm very excited about treating difficulty in breathing now, because we have more at our disposal. And uh, the way that I tell either the, the, the young um, people that have asthma or even uh, some of the uh, adults is try to determine your severity by the frequency of, of symptoms. And this was a nice table written by the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program, the NAEPP, that states that just like COPD, you have a mild category, a moderate, and a severe. And the way that this is differentiated is not so much by the numbers on your FEV1 or the amount of air you could ex exhale in one second, but by how you uh, symptomatically feel. So if you have a lot of symptoms, like frequently, day and night, you have severe. If you have your peak flows that vary from morning to night by 30%, you have severe. If you have an FEV1 less than 60%, you're very severe. So uh, as you can see by the numbers, it progressively worsens as the stage gets higher. And that, again, tells us where you are and what we need to be in, in treating you. And this is just a kind of a, a repeat of what that is, except that it just tells what the symptoms are like. If you're severe, you're very limited in your physical activity. If you're moderate, you can still do some, but it's definitely at um, less than uh, your, your normal. And then if you're mild, you can probably still do what you do. And then if you're intermittent, it only occurs very rarely. Now, why do I point this um, slide out to you? Does anyone know who she is? Yeah, she's an Olympian, Olympian multiple times over, Jackie Joyner-Kersey. 
was a heptathlete and uh, long jumper and uh, won multiple gold medals in Atlanta and um, I don't know if she was in Sydney. I know it was Atlanta at least for sure in 1996. And uh, she um, had exercise induced asthma and she came from a very poor area in, um, in Illinois in the housing projects. And um, she, um, uh, you know, was probably uh, limited as far as her access to health care and her asthma got worse and then until she went to UCLA to become a, um, a scholarship athlete um, you know her her diagnosis uh, was was kind of hit or miss and then finally you know she was uh, under the care of the uh, the, uh, the the team and the, the team recommended her to be checked out in the clinics there and uh, she was diagnosed with exercise induced asthma and uh, since then she's been a, an advocate and a spokesperson for asthma and uh, has really uh, given a lot of awareness to athletes because a lot of times athletes um, don't know that and you could get seriously ill and even even, even die from asthma. It, it is a, a condition that can be serious if not taken uh, you know carefully and uh, she's spoken up for that in that behalf and to uh, be checked regularly to use your medications and even recommend alternative types of exercises if running or something like that is not for you. So she said swimming is a good choice because it's air that is usually warm in the pool, but still beware of the chlorine fumes. Warm up before you exercise, very important, like stretching and also, you know, deep breathing and, uh, you know, make sure you've used your proper medications well beforehand and also a quick reliever 30 minutes before. It was very interesting. In 1972, uh, a swimmer by the name of Rick DeMott was asked to, to choose swimming over track and field because of his asthma. But he used an inhaled steroid for his um, um, meats and uh, it was very carefully looked at because of all the uh, banned substance abuse uh, during those games and he got denied his gold medal and for about 20 years it was uh, taken away from him and he was in shame and then finally because of spokespeople like Jackie Joyner Kersey they found out that it was totally prescribed by his physician it was totally legitimate and it was not performing enhancing it was basically to enable him to be on a level playing field with his counterparts. So he got the gold medal back, uh, although I don't know how much he's, you know, been very, you know, disappointed and upset with the, um, you know, the Olympics for, for denying him when he was supposed to be uh, awarded the, uh, the gold medal. So how can we uh, treat uh, patients with asthma? There's a variety of ways you can treat them. And it's similar to COPD. You use your medications, mostly inhalers, because it's targeted right to the lung. You use spacers because it can hold it better and not spread it throughout the mouth and the oral pharynx. And there's handheld portable electric nebulizers, as well as peak flow meters to monitor you and breathing techniques that you can do that Margaret and other people at our pulmonary rehab has taught all of you and others uh, exceedingly well. And there are hundreds, not hundreds, but 20 or so different inhalers. You know, the ones that most people remember are like albuterol back in the day, maybe 20 years ago, is Alupent. Now there's Zopinex. Uh, you know, there's been Maxair. These are short acting bronchodilators. So, what those short acting uh, inhalers do is open up the bronchial tubes when a, a severe constriction occurs. And they work within 10, 15 minutes. And you could use it by inhalers or by nebulizer. Nebulizers may be a little more effective if you're extremely tight, but studies have shown that if it's used properly, the meter dose inhalers are just as effective. And then there's the, so those are the bronchodilators. Then the anti-inflammatories come in numerous uh, different uh, varieties as well. There's the asthma cord, there's the, the flow vent, pulmacort, asthma nex, and then there's the, the middle ones, which are the anticholinergic, like Atrovent or now Spireva. That uh, works along the nerve endings that innervate the uh, bronchial tubes. So it relaxes it so that the, the smooth muscles can open up and dilate. So there's really three ways to attack it from an inhaler standpoint, not just uh, uh, pills. And of course, the olden days, the pills were Theophylline, like Theodore, but has a lot of side effects with uh, tachycardia, rapid heart rate, uh, and uh, sometimes it can even cause seizures if it's used with other medications that are both cleared by the liver. And then, of course, prednisone and oxygen if you're in, in uh, you know, uh, such a you know, severe condition that, you know, oxygen is important to uh, uh, give better quality of life and better uh, survival rates. Now, how do we determine how good or effective an inhaler is? Because it's not like a pill. So it has to be deposited into the lung. So it's determined by the particle size, 
the device that's used to, to deliver the medication, and the ability of the patients to use this. Are they rheumatoid arthritis, so they can't really use their hands very well? Do they have poor vision? So all these things are important in order to get compliance. So here's a cartoon about a, um, uh, a person using the inhaler. If the particles are five microns or greater, it's too large, so it won't go into the airways, and it will get swallowed and uh, be no, no, of no use. If they're two to five microns, that's perfect. That's the size that gets into the airways, into the lung, and be optimized because it's right where the, the disease is, right where the, the problem lies. And then if it's less than two microns, it may get so well absorbed, uh, inhaled, that it can go from the, capilla from the alveoli to the capillaries and get absorbed into the bloodstream and cause maybe some ill-advised side effects like um, if it's a bronchodilator, you may get jittery or tremulous or rapid heartbeat. Or if it's a steroid, you may get some early determination of osteoporosis, of thinning of the blood, or cataracts. Uh, but you know, all those things need to be monitored. If you, you know, have someone treated long enough, you have to check their bone density. You have to have an ophthalmology exam. And the propellants that are used now, it used to be the CFC, which is a chlorofluorocarbon, was effective because it delivered the two to five microns into the lungs. However, it was bad for the atmosphere. There was some depletion of the ozone layer. And in Montreal, they had a, a, a big international symposium where they eventually phased it out, and now it's no longer in use. So everything that's used now are HFA, or hydrofluorocanes, uh, which are finer propellants. So you may, if you've used the old CFCs in the past, notice that this is a finer mist and that it is environmentally safer, and it's still very effective if you guys use the inhaler. Now they have the DPI, too, the dry powder inhalers. And uh, so the considerations are how easy is it to use, how frequently you have to administer it, and how available it is to deliver the medication into your lungs, how easy the patients can handle it, hand-eye coordination, and of course, constant reimbursement. I've had patients tell me numerous times, Dr. Chu, this is just too expensive. Did you know how much Advir or Simbicort costs? It's $150. I'm in the donut hole. Or I have 10 other medications, and if I have $35 copays on each of those, it's a, a $350 you know, hit on my, on my resources monthly. So you know, we certainly empathize and understand with that. And we try to give samples whenever we can. And also, the pharmacy uh, and the pharmaceutical companies are working in concert to try to give vouchers, coupons, et cetera. And we don't know what's going to happen with the Obama administration as things go on, as far as how well we can cover each and every one of our patients, because we understand that. So I have a lot of patients that say, I can't use the Advir, not because it's not working, or not because I, I don't think that uh, it's benefiting me, but I can't afford it. So they use the albuterol, like the Pro-Air and the, um, let's say, Flovent, or something that continues to give them a combined benefit. I'm OK with that as long as they're okay with it and they use it. Because what good is something that's prescribed but not used, whereas something that may not be, let's say, as effective, it's not much less. It's just like a lot of the um, cholesterol medications are gone generic now, like you know, Lipitor, Zocor, and things like that. You, know, you can't help that. You have to just be, you have to roll with that and just say, okay, we will um, monitor it, but we, we, we know that from a, from a financial standpoint, that's the way we have to go. So we have to uh, be very you know, uh, sensitive to that. Because when, when we check our patients back, you know, we want them to bring with them some knowledge of what they're doing and then how they're, um, how they're feeling. If they're feeling well, obviously their symptoms will be the first thing that'll tell us uh, you know, how their progress is. And then secondly, they can actually be proactive in their, in their checkups by doing the spirometry using the, um, the uh, peak flow. And I'll, I'll show you how that's used in just one minute. Let's skip that. Um, we know that spacers are effective. And this is a good slide to show the difference of a non-spacer and a spacer. So if you look at it, it's, 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 this is a radioisotope to check how much of the drug gets into the lung. Only about 11% get in with the non-spacer. And about 21. A spacer is that tube that, uh, uh, that is used to get the inhaled uh, treatments into the lungs more directly as opposed to just having the canister before. So what is a spacer? Good question. It minimizes the problems associated with the coordination of breathing and the actuation of pumping the device. It enhances the drug delivery to the airways, and it reduces deposition in the oral cavity, like your tongue, your pharynx, your mouth, 
and decreases local side effects like candidiasis, like yeast or thrush, which can happen with the residue and the deposits that occur. That's why people are advised to rinse after they use their inhalers. But if you have a spacer, that becomes less of a problem. That, that's a spacer. That interface between the canister and her mouth is the spacer. It's like a little tunnel. That's for a child and, uh, you know, mass. And this is the, the, the adver discus, which kind of spins it in. It's kind of like a spin inhaler, and it spins that little tape on the, on the right-hand side into the mouthpiece, and the, uh, um, the medication is actually crushed as it's spinning through, so it's in a very fine particulate powder. Here's a turbo inhaler, which is what uh, Pomacort comes in, also kind of like a spin device. And the Foradil, which I like because it's quicker onset in action and lasts 12 hours, and it's like a whistle. So you uh, actually use Foradil, which is like, similar to albuterol. It's fast acting. Uh, it's a bronchodilator, so it opens up the bronchial tubes. It's not for inflammation. But when you use Simbacort, it has Foradil combined with an inhaled steroid. This is a peak flow meter. One digital that you can actually see and record. Another one you could see the, um, uh, the it's like a graduated cylinder. You could see the movement uh, on the right. And here's a, a child using a peak flow meter. And uh, I already went over that. So the, the zones that we want them to um, key in on is being in the green zone, which is at your, at your best, your peak. And if you fall in the yellow zone, that's when you should probably either uh, give a call to your physician, uh, make a checklist on what things may have brought you down, and uh, uh, recognize that. And then also, at times, go a little bit up and um, uh, increase the usage of your medications till you get back in the green zone. So it's called like step-up therapy. And then if you're in the red zone, then you definitely need uh, to be seen, checked out. And if it's so bad, it's... Uh, like weekends or evenings, uh, then either uh, going to the emergency room or the urgent care clinic is, is advised, probably the emergency room. And this is your a asthma action plan, kind of like a, a card, kind of like uh, to just bring to your um, appointments to, or to have just at your own. And asthma action plans, you, you start with uh, long-term control medications, which are just as they are. They're controllers. They're not relievers. Then when need be, if you're not doing well, then you can use your uh, relief medication. I think what's happened so often in the past is people just rely on their relievers and then forget or ignore their long-term controllers because they say, when I'm asymptomatic, why do I even need to use my controllers? Well, because studies have shown that if you have an exacerbation, if you are maintained on your controllers, your quick relievers work better and you have less often exacerbations. That's the most important. You have less often the need to use that. And if you use your quick relievers too often, it becomes um, almost psycho-dependent. You're psychologically dependent on it, even when you're not so good. I mean, when you're not so bad, you use it. And then it suppresses the benefit of its use. Like if you cry wolf too many times, the next time you use it, it's not as effective because you've overused it, you've, you've saturated all the receptors, and then it becomes minimally beneficial. Um, recognize symptoms, use your peak flows, and when and how to seek medical care first, then emergency care. And uh, the nebulizers are used um, because uh, it can get quicker into your lungs, but there's a common misconception that a crying child uh, may um, get more in when their asthma is bothering them, uh, you know, my daughter had asthma when she was young, and when she was crying from an asthma attack, it couldn't get in because your airways close and you're breathing so fast that it's just in the dead space. So crying is not is not, you know, you know it's a misconception that they think that because they're breathing so hard that they're going to get more of it in. And uh, these are devices that uh, a child can use, and uh, they come in these really nice portable handheld nebulizers, which is like, you know, the size of um, an iPhone almost or an iPod. Uh, and you can just carry it with you on trips and stuff like that. And these, these are the nasty bugs that uh, precipitate <laughs> asthma or COPD. And you can find that on MightyMite.com. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously cigarettes is there. Uh, some of these other uh, players are the uh, uh, around the shower curtains like molds uh, and then um, 
Some of the indoor um, allergens are like dust mites. And, uh, you know, uh, all those things are, you know, carefully looked at. And if there's someone that's very sensitive, sometimes they have to reupholster their whole room and household, uh, replace rugs with hardwood floors, uh, control the moisture content in your homes, um, you know, use a HEPA filter to get the, uh, you know, the air purified. And, uh, you know, pets, that's pretty bad, if they're, especially if they're really furry and hairy pets, that they need to be washed a lot more. And um, when the pollen count is high, you have to stay in, indoors. And uh, like in Fremont, uh, this is uh, um, from, uh, from the springtime, but uh, sometimes the allergy counts are very high. Just like uh, in uh, very hot days, the, uh, the uh, air quality is very poor, so you need to stay indoors. But do not panic because there are breathing mechanisms and uh, techniques that you could use, whether it be COPD or asthma. Uh, those that have gone through pulmonary rehab have learned how to purse lip breathe so that they're streamlining their uh, breath in, in and not hyperventilating or wasting a lot of uh, their, uh, their precious breath and then they fatigue and panic and uh, get into trouble. And remember what I said about air trapping, right? So if you panic, you're hyperventilating. When you're hyperventilating, you're just trapping more and more air in your lungs and you're not exhaling it effectively. Diaphragmatic breathing is to let your diaphragm work instead of just using all your chest muscles. And asthma can be controlled and expect nothing less. And uh, when you feel like as a child that, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, it inhibits you as doing your exercise and stuff like that or, uh, you know, a lot of them become very rebellious because they feel, you know, why me type of thing. Well, you know, when, when we have our asthma camps, you know, we try to teach our children, you know, that uh, we can control them. You know, there's, um, you know, there's medications to help, and then if they start feeling better, then they can start doing things. The same with adults. They can start uh, exercising more, and it's treatable, and then, you know, they can uh, celebrate their success. Um, now, the uh, question about the peak flow comes often, and I want you guys to learn how to use it right if you guys are going to go get one. Um, that one that I showed you, that tube, there's a slide indicator that can go from zero to about 800 to a liter or 1,000. You take a deep breath first and then you blow out as fast as and hard as you can. And then you record like the, the best out of the three that you do in that one particular setting. Uh, and then you do that, you know, steps one through four three times and then record your best. And that's where you basically are because there's a, there's a learning curve. So, you know, the first one may not be exactly precise. Then by the second or third one, you've got it down nailed. And you don't have to do this like every 30 minutes or every hour. I mean, it's, it's not like a blood pressure cleft too. You don't, you know, just chase your own tail. You know, you just use it when you feel it's time to check or, you know, once a week. And if you have symptoms that are worse than normal, then you should check it more frequently to see if you've taken a turn for the worse. So that's it for me today. And uh, I'm more than well... Oh, yeah. It depends on your size. Excellent question. I'm sorry I didn't address that. But if you are like medium build, like maybe 150, 175 pounds, probably you would want to be in the four to 500 range. Yeah, I know that's hard. And uh, that'd be the green. And then the, the, the yellow would be about 250 to about 350. And then under 200, it would probably be red. You know, if you're a smaller person, you, you shrink it down about 50 to 100. Yeah, you're very welcome. Let me come over with the mic. Mm -hmm. When you use a uh, nebulizer, should you, after you've used it, feel, feel like you have a sore throat? Am I not using it right? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, yeah, if you're not using it right, yeah, you could get a little bit of a sore throat. And it, and it also depends on, you know, the nebulizer. You know, you know is it one that is more of a gentle mist, uh, you know, aerosolized in, and uh, it, you know, you, you should be able to use it for f 5, 10, 15 minutes without really having, you know, your throat to be sore. Now, if you've got uh, uh, some type of uh, a deposit like a thrush or yeast or something like that, that can irritate you every time you use it. So you sh should have it checked. I have a couple questions. Uh, when you first started off, I believe you said that the COPD, the emphysema was reversible? Yes. If you're on oxygen, mm -hmm. at that point, is it irreversible? I wouldn't say so, because reversibility means that I'm not saying we're taking you all the way back to prior oxygen use. It's a reversible uh, 
por portion that, let's say, if you did your spirometry test and you were 30% or you know, somewhere in the very severe range where oxygen is needed, because I gave you the categories, you know, severe stage, you may be uh, improved by the uh, nebulizer or the uh, inhaled treatments 10, 20%. That means it's partially reversible uh, and because you're on oxygen, will keep the, the uh, arteries from constricting as well. And when you become, even those patients that have a, a pulmonary function test, let's say, and they use the nebulizer and there's no improvement, I mean zero. I mean they went from 30% to 29%, they went down. I don't preclude using it because the physiologic benefit may not be demonstrated on the pulmonary function test, but there may be some component of symptomatic relief of dyspnea, relief of that, that, that high sensation of tightness or air hunger, or um, so it, it, it may be some intangible you know, criteria that we use, but COPD is reversible. I would say if you're gonna look at the spectrum of things, if you have end stage, severe to the point where it's categorized as emphysema, where there's uh, tremendous destruction of the lung architecture, then I would say it's irreversible. And those are the very, very few patients that I've had tell me many times I've not gotten any benefit from my nebulizer or my inhalers and either I'm just wasting my money or that it's causing side effects like my heart rate goes up every time I use it or I'm tremulous. Uh, then I would say, no, that's, that's the, the the patient, small patient population that I would not use it and just use the oxygen and try to use, uh, I would say, you know, more or less what you can do. Your symptoms will have to be restricted and you're gonna have to limit yourself. And that's unfortunately where the, the, the quality of life has to be balanced against, you know, how aggressively you're gonna treat them. You know, you, you, you may not um, get any symptomatic relief and there's definitely no change in the, the spirometry. And those are the uh, very f small, far and few in between patients that I would say to, to not use it. So yes, to answer the question, COPD is reversible and the reversibility has been demonstrated now with Symbacort, with Advir, and not only does it help with the reversibility portion of it, it most importantly helps in the reduction of exacerbations. So studies have shown that if you have, let's say on average, two to three exacerbations a year and maybe more so in the end of the year, like November, December, because that's when the flu seasons are, the bronchitis, pneumonias. Being on maintenance therapy will reduce those exacerbations at least by half. So that may become one, one and a half, two. And that is significant. That's huge as far as quality of life issues are concerned and as far as hospitalizations requiring use of steroids, use of increased oxygen, like higher amounts, and um, the more troubling thing is just what you can and cannot do. You know, if you have an exacerbation, you're completely wiped out that you can't participate in, you know, you know, normal, enjoyable, you know, life experiences. Just two, two words I was interested in, the word uh, uh, dyspnea, is that, is that sensation of lack of air? Is yes. That, okay, mm -hmm. and ac exacerbations? Exacerbations? That's an actual attack. Of, attack, yeah, that's so an that's, attack where you're, um, uh, breathing is very limited, you're constricted, and uh, it's uh, a flare-up, let's just say. If you have a flare-up of your asthma, it's an the exacerbation. The dyspnea would occur first. Yeah, dyspnea could be in degrees. Is so a it sensation? Be, uh, is it yeah, it's a, a sensation. It's, it's actually a sensation. Someone could have severe dyspnea and have fairly decent pulmonary function tests because there's a lot of anxiety. Some person can have real stoic, you know, suppress high pain threshold, high dyspnea threshold, and have terrible pulmonary function tests but are sedentary as can be, and they won't be dyspneic. But that's, is, it's a It's a sensation. Of, it's a psychological, It's a sensation mostly, of lack of oxygen. But it's a warning sign as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to me about coffee? I've been to women's health events and they say, no, no coffee. Then oh. I say asthma, and then they say, oh, drink coffee. So what do you think? Well, you know, coffee is caffeine, and caffeine is a diuretic, but it also is a product that uh, the olden days was um, with theophylin in that same pharmacologic category. So it is a bronchodilator in, in a mild degree. So coffee 
can improve your respiratory stimulation. So you can improve your respiratory status. Uh, I wouldn't say 10 cups of coffee is better than using al albuterol or you know, Advair or th things like that. But coffee drinkers will have that benefit if they don't have GERD. But if they have GERD, it relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter muscle, so there's more reflux. And if there's more reflux, sometimes that acid could spill over into the airways and cause asthma. So you got to be kind of like real careful in, 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 in how to advise coffee. Mm -hmm. The new drug Spiriva, do you believe it is more effective than Advair? Uh, in what uh, disease state? For asthma? No. No, because Advair has got anti-inflammatory, the fluticasone inhaled steroid component, as well as the salmedrol, the cerebrant, the bronchodilating component, which is more the pathophysiology or the disease mechanism in asthma. Whereas in COPD, it's more central and more, uh, you know, uh, there's a, this vagal nerve tone, which is dampened in COPD patients, and the spiriva actually relaxes that so the smooth muscles can be opened up more. I have seldom used Spiriva in asthma patients, and I have often, almost always, used it in COPD patients. Okay. Um, I've, I've put on a, a regimen of, of Spiriva and Advair, uh, Spiriva in the, once a day and Advair twice a day. Is that a usual met, you know, way of prescribing it? Uh, not to violate HIPAA violations, I would assume that there, there's a component of COPD there, and yes, that is a very uh, um, favorable way of treating that because you're, you're uh, managing the constrictive end of the bronchial tubes with the combination Advair with uh, the inflammation, and then the Spiriva, uh, the long-acting uh, Atrovan, I call it, to open up the bronchial tubes. And what's very interesting about that is we are seeing it in the lab, like let's say in the pulmonary function lab or in the exercise lab, that patients can exercise longer when they're on that combination, meaning that that dynamic hyperinflation is reduced. So when you do this to exercise, you get more air out so that you don't get that bucket handle effect where you are so restricted that you, you got to stop. Whereas this will enable that tightness to go like this so it's not going to be a one-way valve where airflow comes in, but you can't exhale. So the, uh, the real exercise proponents are real strong in advocating that combination because if you've been doing that for, let's say, six months or more, the limitations that you might have had prior to it versus how much you can walk or how better your peak flows look should be substantial. I would say if you could walk two city blocks, you could probably walk four if you could get 400 on your peak flows, maybe you could get six, you know, with that physical advantage by being able to exhale fully without it air trapping as you exercise. Why do you think COPD and emphysema patients say, when I'm sitting in the office, I am fine. When I'm just watching TV or reading, I am fine. But when I have to go work around the yard, even walk from the parking lot to your office when it's a, a bad air day and I'm not doing well or... You know, my house is two stories, and I have to go from the first floor or the basement to the bedroom upstairs. I'm just wiped out. That's because of that hyperinflation. You have to expend more energy. You have to use more oxygen, so you have to inhale more, but you can't get rid of it. If, if you're, say, 40 pounds overweight and you lose that 40 pounds, would that make a difference in your COP? Oh, without a doubt. You know, you don't want to be cachectic because sometimes breathing is a huge energy expenditure and most of the, let's say, COPD patients that are mild won't have that cachexia yet. But if you have very advanced COPD or emphysema, like Frank Netter's diagrams, you look like the pink puffer and you're really thin and aesthetic, but the milder, earlier onset COPD patients will probably still not have that cachexia or weight loss because they're not overexpending to breathe. But yes, to answer your question, Ideal body weight, according to, you know, your uh, body mass index is, is very important in COPD patients. Uh, yeah, excess weight can cause sleep apnea, which will uh, restrict breathing, and also will have a 50-pound, 40-pound extra backpack that you're carrying to, uh, to work against your already weakened lungs. So losing 30, 40 pounds uh, the right way 
will alleviate that excess pressure on your chest and will also alleviate the, uh, the uh, excess uh, tissue around your neck. So there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, ability to expand and, uh, you know, have better airflow. Because, you know, when you're overweight, it's going to limit your exercise because your joints are going to hurt because you have to carry more weight also. So if you impede your exercise, you're going to have uh, more atrophy in the respiratory muscles. And then you become more uh, inclined for a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, because one, it feels better to, to not have to work so hard to breathe or work so hard to do the exercise. But yeah, it's very limiting if you're uh, overweight to breathe um, to uh, get the full lung capacity and also to get the air and the oxygen through your lungs back into your heart into the rest of your muscles and tissues because you have so much excess tissue. The excess tissue will be starving for oxygen more so than if you have less mass to carry.